Well, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk at the Nanapore uh, community meeting. Uh, my name's Ian Henderson from uh, the University of Cambridge, and what I'll be talking about is work that we've been doing on uh, the Arabidopsis centromeres using nanopore sequencing. So mainly what I'll be talking about today is um, assembling the centromeres. These, as you may know, are often referred to as the black holes of the genome. So until recently, with the advent of, of long read sequencing, <clears throat> these, these regions of the genome have just simply been too repetitive to assemble. Um, and they're very interesting regions. And so on this slide, firstly, I'm highlighting what their function is. So um, on the top right here, you can see two chromosomes and they're attached to these green microtubules. And so during cell division, what that's gonna do is allow these chromosomes to pull apart and segregate. And the centromeres are the regions of the chromosomes that assemble this orange kinetochore complex that, that binds to the microtubules. Now, this is a very old uh, function in eukaryote cells. And <clears throat> when we consider old things, for example, the ribosome, they tend to be very conserved between species. And what this has led to is this so-called centromere paradox um, highlighted in, in this paper from Steve Henikoff, um, where actually the centromeres are some of the fastest evolving and most diverse parts of the genome despite doing this conserved function. So to highlight this, we have um, a budding yeast centromere shown, which is just essentially a single nucleosome. Um, and then we have much more complex um, centromeres, for example, in the human, where we have these uh, millions of base pairs of satellite repeat um, that are you know, extremely difficult to, to assemble and, and study. Also, there's a uh, so-called holocentric species where the centromere is distributed over the entire length of the chromosome. <clears throat> and uh, mainly what I'll be focusing on today is a model species, a model plant called Arabidopsis thaliana. Um, we've been interested over many years in where recombination happens um, in this plant. So this is shown, this crossover frequency shown in, in kind of purple. And you can see here, we get this striking suppression of recombination around the centromere, as well as enrichment of um, epigenetic marks like DNA methylation. So um, for a number of reasons, you know, these, these very enigmatic regions have, have been of great interest to us. Um, but as I mentioned, um, due to their high sequence repetition, it's been very hard to study them. And so although the, the Arabidopsis genome, it was, it was the first plant to be sequenced. And so back in 2000, the genome was re released. And this is an excellent genome assembly, particularly in, in, the, in the chromosome arms where you know, most of the genes are. However, um, due to the repetition, centromeres and also the, the ribosomal DNA have remained unassembled for, for more or less the last 20 years. And so um, what we did then was to turn to the long read approaches. And so we basically generated um, high depth data sets of both uh, nanopore reads and also PacBio HiFi reads for a particular, the, the reference strain of Arabidopsis columbia. And this allowed us to generate a new genome assembly where importantly, the centromeres were assembled as, as single, single contigs. <clears throat> and you can see here at the bottom, some statistics on um, the, the consensus quality of the genome. And what this has revealed is that in each of the chromosomes, the centromere consists of about um, two megabases of repeats. Um, you can see here, these are quantified by this red line. Um, and so in this case, we have this almost pristine array of, of satellite repeats. And within which, um, shown in black, this particular histone variant, CENH3, is loaded. And it's that which mediates ultimately the, the connection to the, to the microtubules. Now, believe, beneath that, you can see this heat map that is showing um, sequence identity levels and red and white here show very high levels of, of sequence homology um, um, within this array of, of repeats. And so having these, these genome assemblies is revealing new things to us about the, the architecture of the centromeres. And so for example, on the left here, you can see a dot plot analysis of the five Arabidopsis centromeres um, and these kind of blocks of red and blue shading are indicating these highly repetitive arrays of, 
um, satellite repeats. But what you can also see is that there's not much shading between the centromeres. So despite these all being very repetitive and having the same um, type of repeat, at the sequence level, um, each centromere has essentially private variants. And um, Terry and Martin um, in, the, in the Czech Republic were able to validate this also uh, using cytogenetic approaches. So using fish um, and using the assembly, they were able to design these fish probes that can just light up um, individual centromeres. Another interesting feature that has been revealed are these so-called higher order repeats. Um, so these heat maps are showing pairwise comparisons of um, stretches of firstly the Arabidopsis centromere and, and in comparison to a recent assembly um, of human centromere 8. And you can see here like the different colors are showing different levels of similarity. So blue um, would indicate higher levels of similarity. And the human centromere has these very regular um, patterns of higher order repetition. Now, we also see that in the case of Arabidopsis, but it's, it is uh, much less regular. And so the, I think the reason these, these patterns are interesting is it's, it's telling us something about the way that these um, arrays are generated. What are the recombination pathways that are kind of establishing and maintaining these, these arrays of satellite repeats? So um, digging into these patterns is certainly something we're very interested to do. Um, another important feature that the assemblies have revealed is, in addition to these satellite repeats, the centromeres have also been invaded by particular types of retrotransposon that we call Attila. And so you can see here, um, in comparison to the centromere we looked at earlier, um, you can see that the density of the satellites is very much more um, broken up and, and interrupted. And you can see that in, in the identity heat map here, there's much more of this crisscross pattern. Um, and what that's caused by is integration of these Attila elements, a representative one shown at the bottom here. And so these, these transposons seem to have uniquely have the ability to integrate into these regions. Um, and so why they do that and how is, is something that we're very interested in. So just to end the talk, I just wanted to highlight um, some other features of, of nanopore sequencing that have been um, really powerful for you know our studies into the centromeres um, and that the, for, for us one of the main advantages is that the the nanopore data also gives us fantastic insights into the epigenome specifically the the cytosine methylation that occurs in in the centromeres so um, we used our nanopore data together with deep signal plant um, in order to map DNA methylation in these three different types of sequence contexts shown in different colors. And so again, you know, once we've assembled these regions, nanopore is also allowing us to look at how, not only what the architecture of the region is, but also how is it modified um, in different ways with uh, DNA methylation. And uh, this is just to highlight something fun that Matt Nash did in my group, which was to take nuclei, Arabidopsis nuclei, and then divide that material and perform two chip experiments using um, a classic heterochromatic Mark H3K9 dimethylation and the centromeric histone CENH3. Now, what, what he did that was kind of novel is to then just take that chip data and put it straight through a nanopore um, and again use deep signal to then look at the methyl state of the chip DNA. Now, the interesting thing in this case is shown here, so particularly for these non-CG contexts, um, in the centromeres, the CENH3 um, chip had significantly less non-CG. And this is, uh, you know, very interesting observation to us. It, we think it's telling us something about how epigenetic information is, is maintained differently in, in different parts of the centromere. And I think highlights the kind of the, the novel approaches that um, are possible with nanopore technology. So moving forward, the, the questions that are of interest to us and that we hope to continue to use uh, nanopore to address is firstly, what is the structure of the centromeres more broadly within the species and also in closely related species in order to see, understand how, how they're evolving. Um, we're very interested in the recombination pathways that generate these repeats and also how do they relate to uh, chromatin level and epigenetic information. 
Um, we want to know more about these Attila transposons. How do they access the centromere? Why do they uh, why do they appear to be adapted to integrate into these regions? And then two kind of bigger, broader questions are, you know, firstly, why are centromeres so fast evolving despite doing this very conserved role? And what are the forms of selection operating in these regions that may be connected to, to this fast mode of evolution? So just to wrap up, I'd like to acknowledge the fantastic team of people who've contributed to this work. Um, so in Cambridge, Matt, Piotr, Andy, Chris, and Pallas um, have kind of really driven the project. We collaborated very closely with Mike Schatz and Michael Ong at Johns Hopkins uh, to assemble the data. And um, instrumental to this also is Todd Michael's group at the Salk Institute, who um, contributed to sequencing and given us lots and lots of really key input over, over the course of the project. Um, Alex at Sussex did really careful work on the transposon annotation. Martin and Terry um, and Fred's group did lots of cytogenomic uh, validation. And then Tetsuji, Corbini and Rob, Lisa and Urian all also made really important contributions. So um, with that, I'd just like to end and say thank you. <laughs>